Hey there, my Power Book 3 fans. Your girl Bobby J is here with the recap and review of Raising Canaan Season 3, Episode 4, In Sheep's Clothing. So before we get started with this episode, please do not forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share to this channel. I'm catching up, y'all, with these recaps and reviews, so I'm looking forward to seeing some comments down in the comment section. So this episode start off with one of Kanan's little couriers on his motorbike trying to avoid the police who are going after him. And he ended up getting caught and getting arrested. And Kanan reaches out to Uncle Lou, who's like, what's going on? What you into? I know it ain't no, nothing good. And he needs him to get this kid, my friend, out of jail. He said, what that your friend got to do with you? And he was like, well, he don't have no family. He said, well, I don't know this little nigga, you know. So he said, what's his name? He said, Javon. So he reached out to Uncle Lou real quick to get Javon out, just to let y'all know, because it's going to come up again. So he lets him, he goes in there to get him out. Meanwhile, Rock is signing a lease to purchase, what is that, um, Southside Plaza. And she buys the whole plaza, and the realtor is letting her know it's as is. She's responsible for everything else, yada, yada, yada. He leaves out, goes across the street, is talking to the police. She sees them out the window laughing and stuff. So the, the realtor looks, sees her, and walks away. The police wave her to come over there. She comes over there, and they start letting her know how dangerous the area is and how there could be a lot of, you know, break-ins and property damage and that's where we come in, you know, we could kind of help avoid it, you know, or stop it from even happening or be there, you know, basically they trying to get up for some money. These are dirty cops, you know, to, you know, so she, they could be protection. That's what it is, the protection money. And she said, I'll keep it in mind. And when she turns to walk away, they go, how's your son doing? He's in high school, right? She's like, what do you know about my son? So they done looked her up and everything and they laughing and giggling and thinking it's funny, but I already don't like them. Then we have a scene with Ronnie. He going to see uh, these two people for money. I think their name is Snaps and Pops. It's Wendell Pierce plays the, one of those characters. And he's going to, you know, try to get some money from them to get some business going. And Wendell's telling him, you know, give you need time to get a plan together. You know, if that's what he's doing. He's like, yo, Neek's plans are being made by his ding dong. You know, he effing the competition. They like, who you, who he effing? He said, rock. And they like, you know, this business makes strange bedfellows, you know. So they told him they would give him part of the money, but he would have to get the rest of the money from other people to start his business. Because, you know, Ronnie is being impatient and don't want to wait on Unique. So now we have Marvin going to see Gerald, you know, to bring him his ID and stuff that he took from him the other night when he drove him home. And he learns that Gerald's an editor or of like entertainment for the village voice and Marvin's like what you know about music and entertainment and stuff you dress like a banker you know and they talk in and stuff and come to find out you know both Gerald and Marvin are missing Miss Renee remember she got shot up because of that mess that Marvin was in so they talked and they decided you know they're gonna do their own little group thing they're gonna be their own little brother's keeper and look out for each other which I think is so cool. I like seeing this other side of Marvin and who he is and can be. You know what I mean? So they they hug and shake on it and they make a pact that they're going to look out for each other. Now we at the precinct and those detective or FBI agents, they call in um, Detective Howard and they still telling him that they're having this issue wrapping their head around this Crown Camacho being responsible for all of this drug stuff when all he is is a music guy that they learned. So, you know, Detective Howard gave his little insight, which was BS. So they thanked him for his insight. And as he left out the door, they called him back and asked what's going on with his shooting. He said just theories and everything else, you know, it seemed to be quiet on Southside Jamaica. And they was like, oh, OK. And they just he left. Then we see a quick scene with Jukebox taking a, a physical before going into basic training for the army. And she's being questioned by the doctor, asked all these questions. And I don't know, Jukebox is feeling, I think, kind of strange about wanting to do this. I think she might be second-guessing herself. In the meantime, we got Panessa confronting Unique about sleeping with other girls. And he tells her all she needs to be concerned about is that he's taking care of her and their, their son. And she's like, that's not enough. And he just put down his sandwich and gets up and said, you know what? He walks out and said, it ain't never enough. 
You know, I said, she's like, well, let them wash your clothes and let them do this. I'm sitting there going, honey, if you sitting home and ain't doing nothing else, you need to chill and just roll with it. Save up some money so you get your own place if you having a problem with that. You know what I mean? Then we have Rock. She's at Kanan's school and she sees him conducting some kind of business right in front of the freaking school door. And I'm sitting there going, that's kind of stupid. You know, in my mind, that's what I'm saying. But she said she just wanted to put eyes on him and see him for a minute. He's like, well, I'm here. And she was asking him, who's that? Your friend? He said, those are my friends. She said, your friends got beepers and bikes now. He said, they do what they do. So the bell rings and he has to go in and she's watching and something clicks in her mind when she sees him going through the metal detector. But I wasn't sure what it was until the end. So now we have Dean showing up at the bingo place with his grandma. And who's sitting there playing bingo but Ronnie waiting for him. So Dean tells him that he's out of the business in South Jamaica. And that if his last name is Mathis, he don't F with him or his brother. So Dean asked him, does Unique know you there? He said, it ain't about him. He said, well, you're not going to find no work here. So Ronnie grabbed him by his clothes and said... I ain't the igger you say no to. And um, Dean's boy came over and stuck a gun right in Ronnie's rib like, you need to go. And Dean said, and I ain't the igger you put hands on. You don't run me, Ronnie. I run you. And I will run your effing ASS into the effing ground. And he said, oh, so you supply my brother, but you don't supply me. He said, your brother's work comes from the Colombians. He's not thinking. If he said, I don't mess with you and your brother then that means he ain't supplying your brother. And it's not in Ronnie's head. That man is mental. So now we have Paul showing up to Famous in Kanan's apartment, complaining about the fact that his carriers are never available because now they all running around doing this weed shit with him, you know, with them. And they hurried up and slammed the door closed like, yo, don't be saying that out loud. He said, look, you told me you was going to make me more money, but I'm losing money. And so Kanan hits him off you know, a couple, probably hundred dollars or whatever, said, this will tie you over. He said, yeah, but it's not going to solve my problem. So Kanan's like, I'll talk to the guys about their hours with us and all of this stuff, trying to be big boss and all that cool stuff. Anyhow, now we switch over to Jukebox, the her and her father chilling on the couch and somebody's ringing the doorbell. Of course, Marvin don't get up. So Jukebox goes to answer it. And this lady turns around and said, I'm glad you answered your door because you damn sure don't answer your phone. And she told her, Jukebox, you made it to the group. And Jukebox was like, yeah, she's so excited, she, you know, and everything. And the lady sits down with her and Marvin and starts telling her about this formula for success that she has for the group. So Marvin lets her know that Jukebox is going to be Jukebox. She ain't changing for nobody. And he, she said, we don't want her to change all the way down to her name. She said, we got our diva, our girl next door. And jukebox, our tomboy, you know. So, so Marvin asked Juke what she want to do, and Juke said, "I think yeah." So she's in the group now. So now we see a scene with Rock sitting outside in front of Kanan in famous building, and Kanan leaves out. And once he leaves out, she goes in. But while she's going in, there's somebody sitting in a van taking pictures of her. So I don't know if they're watching Kanan or they're watching a the drug activity in that building. Or they just following Rock. But they can't be following Rock if they already got a parking spot or whatever. But anyway, they take pictures. She goes in there. Famous just lit up a blunt. He's working on his rap music. He said, you know. And she's at the door. And he's like, Kana told me not to let you in. She said, I ain't playing with you, Famous. So he lets her in. She takes a gun out of her pocketbook. And he's like, Miss Rock. And she puts it into Kana's book bag. And told Famous he don't see nothing. He better not say nothing stay out of family business and so famous is standing there and she tries to give him money he doesn't want to take it, but he takes it and she leaves out and he just throws it on the floor he's pissed now because now he in the middle of some mess and Kanan said if she came in there again he's gonna whoop that ass and now famous is scared now we have Kanan running up on jukebox in a pizza parlor to congratulate her he trying to let everybody know my 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 cousin's on the TLC tip. She about to blow up. She's like, keep that to yourself. He said, man, please, your father's planning a parade down Jamaica Avenue right now. And <laughs> she's laughing and stuff. So he tell her he going to take her to B. Smith's for a celebratory dinner. And, of course, she's asking him, you know, about where he got the money, how he got money for that. He said, don't worry, I saved her for a rainy day. She said, how much time I got? He said, you better hurry up and get dressed quick because I already made reservations. So they get to B. Smith's and they're sitting there looking at the menu. Of course, stuff is expensive. But anyway... 
you know, he tells her that he's so proud of her. He knew this would always happen one day. That's why when he was younger, how he used to get scared when people would take her away. And he knew they would know how great she was. And then she'd be on the road gone all the time. And she's just laughing and stuff. So he tells her that he's proud of her and that he loves her. And she said she loves him too. And then they toast. So now we have Marvin at Lou's spot. And he's letting him know the good news about, you know, jukebox. And Lewis, like, he's feeling bad for what he did. And he says, see, she didn't need me anyway, you know. But, you know, Marvin let him know that the work he did with her did pay off. But he also told him about, you know, keeping your promise and your word to children. You know, when you say you're going to do something, you do it. And he said he understand, you know, he feels bad for letting his niece down. So now he's asking Marvin what he's doing later that night. Because he's feeling they could probably do some business together. So Marvin is like, okay, cool. I'm down for making money. And he said, but you better hit them showers first. <laughs> he told um, Lou to hit the shower. And Lou smelling himself. I was like, oh, Lord, they so silly. Anyway, so while they're getting ready, it switches over to Rock and Unique having dinner together. And Unique tells Rock that Dean let him know that Ronnie came through and stuff. And he said he must have been saying a lot of ish. Because for Dean to tell me, Dean ain't got no love for me whatsoever, you know. And, he, and Rock is like, I thought you was putting him on with some business. And he said, I ain't find nothing for him yet because what he's good at is very specific. And she said, ish that he bad for ain't specific at all. And Unique looked at her like, mm. and she was right about that. So now we over at Cafe Vu's with Marvin, Lou, and is her name Shirley? I think it is. Anyhow, she was saying that she could use some young guys like them to work with and help you know rebuild and reimagine that space she figured she got about two more years doing that and then she could like probably hand the place over to somebody else so you know marvin was giving his two cents and lou was you know giving his two cents and then they toasted to working together now we have crazy ronnie standing outside some italian restaurant and joquan and juliana come out and he tries to hurry up and follow them, but the two bodyguards stop him. And he goes, yo, I'm Neek's brother. And they like, what do you want? Your brother's not a popular person around here. And so he says, I need some product. I want to make y'all some money. Juliana's like, we not interested. And Ronnie said, if, you know, my brother's a problem. Problems always got solutions. And that's when um, Jaquan said, you know what? We wish you luck. And their bodyguards told him it's time to go. And they had the guns out pointed at him. And Ronnie yells, I ain't Neek. And Juliana stared, turned around and stared at him for a long time. Like she wanted to say something or, I don't know, acknowledge something. But she just got into the car and Ronnie didn't notice her staring. So now back to Rock's house where Unique and Rock are in the kitchen. Seemed like they're putting away dishes and stuff. And Rock is checking him out and then she lets him know that... um. They may have to pump the brakes on what they're doing and pause a bit because she has um, Kanan going to be coming home soon. And he's like, oh, y'all worked it out? She said, I'm working on it. And and she said, I told him I'm out of the business and I can't have no wilding out around me. You know, basically, you know, them wilding out and what Unique is trying to get into it. So she's trying to stay out of that business. And he said, well, we were just kicking it anyway, right? And she said, right, you know. And he said, so one last time for the road. And she was like, cool. And he put her up on top of that countertop, baby. And they was getting it on. So now it switches over to Jukebox coming down the hall, going into an apartment. And the one who's the diva is in there singing. And then she got, oh, Boombox, right? She said, no, Jukebox. And then the one who's the girl next door is the what she called. She called Jukebox um, Polo Girl. And Jukebox called her Mint Lady because, remember, she gave Jukebox a mint in the bathroom. So those two hit it off. They all good and feeling great. They get to meet the lady who is in charge. And she tells them the name of their group is going to be Butter with an A. And the diva said, I don't think I like that. And the lady said, she snapped there and said, I don't give a damn. She said, as far as I'm concerned, I am God. And the only voice that you should be hearing in yours head is mine. She said, you ain't nothing until I say you something. She said, and y'all going to do what I tell you to do. I'm above your mama, your friends, your boyfriend, 
everybody. She put it in check, looked them all in the face, walked up and down, and then told them, we trying to get y'all together in about two or three weeks. We're going to put you in front of all these top executives. And if you they like you, you'll be on the road in three months. And if they don't like you, then Butter was just another baby that never should have been born. Now, let's get started. I said, okay, girl. All right, let them know. Next, we have Kanan coming into school, going through the metal detector, and it's ringing off. He's like, oh, yeah, metal detector is broken. And they start going through his bags, and he's like, see, it's just my books and my jacket. And then they pull out the gun. He's like, that's not mine. That's not mine. And they handcuff him, take him to the principal's office, call his mama. Rock gets there, and she's playing all innocent, like, I am so disappointed in you and stuff. You know, <laughs> they had him handcuffed and everything to the chair. So I'm assuming Dr. West is the principal. So she's reminding him and we were supposed to be getting you in a specialty school. I remember you wanted to do that. And I don't know now, look where we are and stuff. And he's like, it's not mine. Somebody must have put that in there. And so then Rock tells Dr. West, I'm not trying to make an excuse, but recently our family had some violence visit us and maybe Canaan was just trying to protect himself. And he's like, what? Get out of here. So the principal tells him that. Um, the police department must be looking out for him because they have decided not to press charges against him. And Rock is saying, praise God. But uh, Dr. West did say the only saving grace in is not much is that there was no ammunition in the gun. Then she adds that they're going to let ACS handle the situation and that over the next 24 to 48 hours, they'll be contacted by a social worker who will do like random visits to the house over the next six months. Not only just to check on Kanan's progress, but to also check on the living conditions and suitability of the home as well. And if you violate those terms put forth by the social worker, which will probably be something like a curfew and accountability of your whereabouts, you will find yourself in front of juvenile court. I said, oh, snap. And she said, it's not just you who could face prosecution. They could file charges against your mother as well. I said, oh, snap. She said, and you don't want that. And Kanan is sitting there pissed as ever because now he got to go home with his moms and he's trying to debate with her outside in front. And she's like, there ain't no if ands, and buts about it. I ain't catching no case because of your ass. So if you talking about going home, you mean to the house that we supposed to be living in together. So get in the car. And I said, oh, there was that. But I have a feeling that what Rock is doing here is going to backfire on her some way, somehow. And Kane is going to find out. So now Unique gets home and he confronts Ronnie who's sitting there eating pizza and drinking some orange soda. <laughs> and he's like, what you and Dean talk about? And he talking about who? He said, don't F with me. What do you and Dean talk about? He said, I ain't seen Dean in years. He said, oh, so now you calling a Iga liar? Because he told me himself you came up to him. He's turned and said, I said what I said. And Unique said, you ain't ish, Ronnie, and walked away. And you could tell by the expression on Ronnie's face, he was pissed about something and someone. So now Rock gets Kanan home, shows him his room. It looks nice. Kanan's pissed as ever because he don't want to be there. And then the next thing you know, Rock gets a visit from Detective Howard, who's letting her know that this is messed up what's going on. How he taking a gun to school and stuff. This is all on you. That if he felt scared or something, that's because of the mess you bring to him. And she, he told her he ain't taking her calls no more. She gonna have to figure this ish out on her own. And he also let him know that the feds ain't believing that mess about Crown. And they probably got eyes on her now. And if they got eyes on her, they got eyes on Kanan. And she goes, well, there ain't nothing to see. So now it's over to Marvin and Lou. And Marvin's talking about moving some drugs through there. And Lou's like, nah, nah, please do not dirty this place up. Don't dirty me up. Don't dirty up her club. He said, well, how am I supposed to make some money? He said, off the door and off the bar. He said, well, you're going to have to start watering down them drinks because Miss Shirley be doing some deep pours. He said, well, I'm working on that. But, you know, he wants to do music. And that's why he's trying to keep it clean. And Marvin need to check himself on that. And then it ended with Dean at his grandmother's house. He changing her battery in her hearing aid. And Ronnie comes up the back steps or basement steps some kind of way, grabs a knife and knifes him in the side about eight times, telling him he should have kept his mouth shut, Iga, just like that. I said, Dad, Ronnie's straight up crazy. I told y'all he had that look in his eye like something was up. So y'all let me know what y'all thought about this episode. You know, I thought it was crazy, just like all the rest of them, because Ronnie is a loose cannon, and he don't care about nobody but Ronnie. Anyway, 
Happy holidays to all of you. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Seasons greetings. Happy Kwanzaa and all that stuff. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. And I will see you all in the next video. It's your girl Barbie J saying peace.